This is Module 10, Practical Interior Lighting, the last of 10 modules for this V-Ray training series. Just as I did in Module 9, Practical Exterior Lighting, here I want to demonstrate several different ways to approach lighting the scene. Not only will I cover many different light source types commonly used for interior lighting, I'll put numerous different render and material settings to the test to show you how to get different looks to your images and precisely control the relationship between speed and quality. Before I begin, just like I did with Module 9, I need to give some background information about the scene that we're going to be working on, and I want to also address some workflow issues that I think are important to mention early on. I'll start by showing a panorama of the scene that we're going to be looking at, and this is a good scene to demonstrate on, I think, because it's not too small, it's not too large, it's not too simple, and it's not too complex, and it contains some fairly decent architecture and design. It's a two-story condominium, and it's one of five units in this one building. And this panorama shows the view from the living room. And here's another showing the view from the master suite. And finally, the view from the dining room. This scene was created for a development called Lusa Villas. Luso, which means luxury in Italian. Luso Villas in Naples, Florida, and from the outside, this is what the building looks like. As I said, it's a multi-unit condominium building, and the unit that was built in 3D is this N unit right here. It's quite a nice design containing an enclosed pool area, and from a different view, you can see an up-close view of the exterior of the unit. Here we illuminated the scene, the exterior here, with single direct light, but as we'll see, using a single exterior light just won't be sufficient for an interior scene. The areas that I'm going to be focusing on are the three rooms that I showed in the panoramas. The living room is behind these sliding doors here, the dining room is behind these windows here, and the master suite is located on the other side of the living room. And here's a look at the floor plan. The exterior image was a mirrored version of this floor plan, but nonetheless, this is the unit that I'm going to be working on, so the scope of the project only included these three rooms, the living room, dining room, and the master suite. Notice that it's a two-story unit, and that makes the scene a little more interesting to work on and gives us a little more work to do. Also, notice in the panorama files that the rooms are fully furnished. These panoramas show the project is completed, but in the max file that I'm going to be starting on, there's no furniture because just like the excluded vegetation and cars and other things in Module 9, you really need to do the majority of your lighting test without all the extra polygons that come with this furniture. Um, including in here will only increase render times uh, when you do your test renders. And besides this, I wouldn't usually even have the furniture to place in the scene at the time which I start working on the lighting. There's a certain workflow that I recommend following for any 3D project, and before beginning any work on the materials and lighting, I always send QuickTime panoramas to clients, asking them to verify the architectural correctness of what they see. And then and only then do I proceed with materials and lighting. So in this scene, here's an example of what I would send to the client. And from this, they can tell me if something is amiss or if something's wrong, and I can correct it early on and not waste time redoing any material or lighting work. It also gives them more time to work on providing me the materials and the furniture, which for me always seems to be the last thing that they have ready. If I was fortunate enough to have the furniture selections provided early on, I would have those custom pieces worked on concurrently with the 3D scene so that no time is wasted. But the bottom line is, if I had the custom furniture already built or the stock furniture already picked out before the material and the lighting phase began, I would still work on the materials and the lighting before inserting the first piece of 3D furniture. The 3D furniture obviously has a major impact on the way light bounces around a scene, but not so much so that it justifies conducting test renders with all those extra polygons. Well, this is not a discussion on Max and how to apply textures and mapping, so for the purpose of this demonstration, I'll start working on a scene where materials and mapping are already applied. What I will do, however, is change some of the already applied materials to show some of the changes that you might naturally want to make through the various V-Ray settings available. For example, I'll add glossy reflections to the floor. Before starting this tutorial, I would recommend downloading a plugin called Color Correction. It 
It's not a requirement at all, but some of the materials in the scene take advantage of this plugin. And if you don't have it, you'll receive a message indicating that you have a missing file uh, when you try to load the scene or when you at least try to merge the furniture into the main scene. You can download this plugin at no charge from this website you see here, uh, cunitosdas.com. And I'm not sure I even pronounced that correctly, but as you can see from the description on the website, Color Correction or Color Correct is a 3ds Max texture plugin which alters the colors of any bitmap or procedural texture so that you can fine tune the colors uh, or create a variation of it. So let's go ahead and get started. And if you want to follow along in this scene, uh, open the file luso-01.max. The first thing I want to point out is this scene will never contain objects that you wouldn't see from the inside of the unit. In other words, just like I don't include furniture at this point, there would be no reason to have objects like cars or trees or vegetation or pavers uh, that you can't see directly from inside the unit. So whenever possible, um, always try to keep your units, always try to keep your interior scenes self-contained and keep your outside objects minimal uh, and as few as possible. So whenever you're required to build both an interior scene and an exterior scene like I did for this particular project, I would recommend creating two separate scenes whenever possible. And there's numerous reasons why you would want to work this way rather than the obvious benefit of reduced file size. And as a side note, after the lighting and render settings are established, I'll merge all the furniture shown in the panoramas. And you can do this as well by merging the file luso furnitured.max. All the furniture in the scene was custom made, so feel free to use it in any of your projects if you like. With all that being said, here's the 3D interior scene for this project. The scene contains 61 objects and over 600,000 faces. There's five cameras for each of the different perspectives that I'll be working on, and there are five lights which are only used to illuminate the background objects. Um, I have my typical background rig here, which I use on almost all of my scenes, both interior and exterior. And as you can see here, all the objects are explicitly named, and if you analyzed each object, you would find that most are collapsed down to an edible poly or an edible mesh, except for some that require a UBW map modifier. So uh, with that exception, everything is collapsed down to its uh, base mesh or poly object. I want to point out that the walls, the windows, doors were built with the box modeling method, i.e. primarily using the edit poly method, uh, the edit poly modifier. And instead of keeping them together as one multi sub object uh, element or object, the different elements were separated so they could be hidden and isolated individually. There's an object called building wall top, which looks like from the, the outside that it might be the second floor ceiling, but it's really not. This object was just a leftover object from box modeling, and another object exists that represents the ceiling and the floors. Um, this wall top object obstructs the view of the interior scene, uh, which from the outside it does, which is why I will hide it from time to time to view the interiors from the outside. But I don't want to delete it because leaving it can help prevent the possibility of light leaks through the walls and through the real ceiling. There's numerous window and door openings which I'll have to deal with from a lighting standpoint. And if I hide this main building object, uh, the main wall object, you can very clearly see everything in the scene. There's no lights in the scene at this point except for the background lights that illuminate the background objects. And if I render right now, I would see nothing but blackness. Before I add my first light, I'm going to enable environment lighting and render the scene with just environment light so that you can see all the settings that I adjust when I do this job for real. And I'm going to make adjustments to the default render settings so that you can see the lighting in the scene develop from scratch. So when you open up the scene, the render settings that you see will be the same render settings that you would see if you had V-Ray 1.5 uh, loaded from scratch. So instead of manually changing all these settings, uh, I would usually just load my interior test render preset uh, from the system rollout, and that would save me a lot of trouble of doing what I'm doing now, which is manually changing all the settings that I want to change for these test renders. Now, in some cases, I'll just make it...